Odysseus, bravest of heroes, draw near to us on our green island. Odysseus will teach you wisdom, will give you love sweeter than honey. The songs we sing soothe away sorrow, and in our arms you'll be happy. Odysseus, bravest of heroes, the songs we sing will bring you peace. That is the song of the sirens. What Homer was describing could very well apply to research, especially to surveys. Major organizations have lost billions of dollars over the years by not properly paying attention or being aware of the inevitable risk of survey sirens. One of the sirens is complex products. Another is a genre crossing product. Another would be time sensitive or ephemeral products. And finally, we have guilt and shame-based behaviors and impulse products. Complex products are very difficult for consumers to be able to assess without a prototype being in their hands. One example might be a certain MP3 player. It had a library feature and a shuffle feature. These things were kind of revolutionary and made that product far more complex than the average MP3 player of the time. You probably know the product I'm referring to, and it was a complete home run. I'll bet if they hadn't prototype tested that, they would have misread its potential for market success. Genre crossing products are also particularly difficult for consumers to be able to assess. Many people will go to, for example, a film based on celebrity appeal or because it's a horror film or a sci-fi film or a romance. If you start to cross two sets of lines together, consumers have a hard time figuring out, is that the kind of film I'd like to see? A gay Western romance. A racially diverse hitmen team who break out in dance. A near forgotten American statesman stage play done in rap music format. Any products like that that cross genre lines tend to be far more complicated for consumers to be able to assess. Hence, if you survey them and get their intent to view those types of films or watch those TV shows that cross genre lines, you will frequently get inaccurate information. If the survey siren you're concerned about is a genre crossing or complex product, then why not beta test it? Put that rather unusual film in front of actual viewers of different segments. Put that rather complex music playing product in the hands of a panel of consumers who will actually use it and try it for a few weeks. That's the way you can get through some of that baffle gap that happens when a consumer really doesn't understand what they're being asked in a survey. Let's move on to ephemeral concerns. These are time-based situations where a set of contextual situations exists for only a moment in time. The weather station forecasts an incoming snowstorm. Your intent to buy a snow shovel rises. The snowstorm passes, your intent to buy a snow shovel falls you would need to know the context under which your purchase intent for buying a snow shovel was actually received. Context is key. Two other survey sirens are guilt and shame-based behaviors and product purchases. When consumers feel there's an obligation to say they'll do the right thing in terms of the planet, they have a tendency to overstate their eventual behavior. How much extra would you pay for fair trade coffee? 20% or 30%? Oh, I think 20%, yes. But then you should go to the shelf and you don't pay 20% more, you buy the regular product. So anytime you're dealing with guilt or shame, consumers tend to often say what they think you want to hear or they want to believe of themselves, their own self-image, which is a little bit more optimistic than their real day-to-day -day behavior ends up being. So if consumers tend to overstate their eventual behavior when it comes to issues of guilt and shame, do they ever underestimate their behavior? Those survey sirens are just as dangerous. Survey sirens involving things like impulse products. Have you ever bought a $1.89 chocolate bar at the point of sale of a grocery store? That's a ridiculous price given that 50 feet away, you can buy four of those same bars for $2.99 and yet, convenience. Last couple sirens in the bucket of impulse behaviors would be, for example, packaging. Packaging plays a huge role in the purchase of fragrances. Some are shaped like small hand grenades or women's bodies or other cut glass approaches. 
which are amazing to look at, but of course we would never admit have an impact on our purchase behavior. There are ones shaped like hand grenades. Honest God. That's awful. It's weird. How many of you at home have one of those beer can hats? How many of you have bought a $40 concert t-shirt that's only ever been worn once? Those are classic situations for impulse purchases. We don't plan them and we wouldn't admit to doing them on a survey in advance. And yet, we do them. Fashion cravings are classic situations where we will get impulse behavior. Ask how rational it is for consumers to admit that they're gonna spend thousands of dollars on a pair of pre-ripped jeans. What is your intent to buy a bunch of rubber outdoor colorful shoes? There are a lot in closets all across North America right now. I'm guessing you haven't worn them recently. A lot of these fashion cravings come and go. They are not only ephemeral, one of the previous sirens we mentioned, but also impulse oriented because people are smart enough to get those products in front of you when you've got the coin in hand. The last area of underestimation that can draw us on the rocks of sirens is that consumers tend to not be realistic about how many lowbrow and tawdry activities they're going to partake of. Would you watch a show about people who cheated on their spouses? Would you watch a show about the very tedious lives of ultra-millionaires? These topics and more continually fuel the top 50 TV programs. We all have guilty pleasures. We're just not always terribly honest about them in advance. Which raises the question, how do you avoid the survey sirens? One way we avoid survey sirens is to make sure the respondent has more choices in their responses. For example, instead of a straight, would you watch this tawdry show or not, we'll give them a degree of agreement scale or a likelihood to watch. Give them more choices, they might be more honest than a polar yes, no option. To overcome the risk of denial among lowbrow behaviors, frequently we will use a, a basic diary. A pretty easy tool, really. But at the end of a week or at the end of a day, consumers are far more likely to indicate what they watched by day or what they listened to by hour than they would be if you asked them in advance. And finally, one thing you should consider is, am I really doing the right thing by trying to find this information through a survey at all? Should I potentially be looking at qualitative research? For example, qualitative techniques do tend to be better at unpeeling layers of complexity, of getting underneath at what really is driving consumer behavior, about getting honesty through a variety of exercises that are more in-depth and more intimate and more interactive than a survey. So those are the survey sirens. Beware their sweet sounding call.